Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Rock Center for Corporate Governance. My name is Mike Callahan. I'm the professor of the practice here at Stanford Law School and the executive director of the Rock Center for Corporate Governance. And I'm delighted to welcome you to our session this morning on ESG shareholder activism. I'm joined by three experts uh, that you can see here on the screen uh, who I will introduce in a minute. Just a couple of logistics items. We are recording this session, as you just heard from the Zoom announcer. Uh, we will do roughly 40 minutes or so, 35, 40 minutes of topics among the group, the speakers, and then we'll turn to audience Q&A. Today, we are going to use the Q&A tab on your Zoom screen, so please do put your questions there, and I will moderate uh, and select, uh, select the questions from there and ask them to the audience. Please don't use the chat format. Uh, I'm not quick enough to monitor both, uh, so I want to make sure that I see your questions uh, in the session. Um, and so now I will turn uh, to introduce our speakers. Uh, Tara Gienta is a partner in the litigation department of Paul Hastings and is a recognized risk strategy and compliance expert and advisor to global companies on corporate governance and enterprise risk management. Tara is co-lead of the ESG risk strategy and compliance group and vice chair of her firm's investigations on white collar defense practice which is routinely recognized as a leading investigations practice and one of a handful of global elite practice groups by Global Investigations Review. She advises clients on fraud, waste, and abuse, as well as on ESG and human rights issues. She's a founder and editor of the firm's publication, Breaking the Glass Ceiling, Women in the Boardroom, now in its fifth edition. And she speaks often on corporate governance, compliance, and internal investigations, and is a frequent flyer here at Stanford Law School, which we appreciate as well as on uh, speaking on board diversity. Tara was also a recipient of Corporate Council's 2019 Women, Influence and Power in Law Awards under the thought leadership category. Tara, delighted to have you with us. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Eduardo Gallardo is a partner in the New York office of Paul Hastings and is global co-chair of the Mergers and Acquisitions Group. He focuses his practice on M&A, takeover defense, shareholder activism defense, and corporate governance matters and has substantial experience in the technology, financial services, telecommunications, energy, real estate, healthcare, and life sciences industries. He's been named a deal maker of the year by the American Lawyer. The National Law Journal has also named him among its MA and antitrust trailblazers. Mr. Gallardo is a member of the firm's, I'm sorry, a member of the Board of Visitors at Columbia Law School and a member of the Board of Advisors at the Institute for Law and Economics at the University of Pennsylvania. He's a member of the advisory board of the Columbia Law School's blog on corporations and capital markets a member of the Society of Corporate Secretaries and Governance Professionals, and was elected as a fellow of the American College of Governance Council. Thank you, Eduardo, for being with us. Oh, thank you, Mike. And last but not least, Pete Michelson joined Catalyst in June 2020, and he leads the firm's activism and shareholder advisory practice, serving as a senior advisor to Catalyst clients across all sectors of technology on matters including activism, defense, proxy fights, contested situations, defense preparedness, and complex ESG matters. He has over 20 years of investment banking and legal experience. Prior to joining Catalyst, Pete spent 11 years at Goldman Sachs, where he was most recently the head of activism and shareholder advisory for the Americas, and four years at PJ, Tamber, PJ Camberview, where he served as president and head of contested situations. He began his career at Merrill Lynch, where he worked as an M&A generalist, analyst, and associate. Pete has advised on over 70 shareholder activism proxy fight and hostile takeover engagements for clients with an aggregate market cap of more than 400 billion, including technology firms such as Dell, eBay, Emulex, HB, International Rectifier, Mentor Graphics, Microl, MSE Software, Plantronics, Verant, Yahoo, one of my former employers, and Zora. Pete, welcome. Thanks for being here. You're muted. Even three years in, we still got to remind people sometimes. Now you're back. All right. Thanks, thanks, thanks for having me. <laughs> having having trouble with the technology. <laughs> All right, welcome. So, Pete, let's start with you. Uh, I'd love to start with an overview of the current activism and ESG activism landscape. What you're seeing in terms of recent years, in terms of progression and hot issues, and expected activity for 2023. So, please start us off. Absolutely. And thanks again, Mike. Um, so I generally talk about activism as being big A economically focused activism and little a, so ESG focused activism. Um, and so big A, big a activist situations are public campaigns and proxy fights. They're generally focused on economic objectives 
and they're conducted by significant shareholders. So think about an Elliott situation or Icon situation. And then there's little a activism, and those are campaigns that are focused on ESG objectives. And they're not directly economic. They're generally conducted by smaller de minimis shareholders. And a lot of times they're, they're conducted through uh, shareholder proposals. Um, the really interesting dynamic that we're seeing now is that there's convergence between those two. And, and so a little bit on that, you're starting to see little a ESG issues underpinning full on proxy fights. And we're also seeing big A activists really taking to heart and incorporating the ESG factors, not just governance, but ENS factors into their campaigns. So that's the overarching uh, landscape. I'm going to talk a little bit about the trends we're seeing in big A activism. So I'll focus really on, you know, larger situations above $500 million and I eliminate some duplicative situa situations, bump etage, et cetera. But really in 2020, we saw a significant slowdown in, in activism due to COVID. So it dropped about 30% year over year. And, 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 and then in 2021, that level remained roughly flat. Some of the reason it didn't spring back was COVID uncertainty, but a lot of that was due to significant increases in value, valuation. So activists are, are value-oriented investors and you know valuations became very pricey. However, where we did see activism in 2021, it was really focused on M&A. So forcing sales of companies. So think, you know, Jana at Zendesk. And, and there was, you know, robust strategic activity and there was a robust uh, private equity bid. Now in 2022, with market volatility, uh, it, rising interest rate environment, and, and a lot of folks being inwardly focused, there's less of that M&A bid out there. It's still, still an active M&A environment. You just can't count on a bidder to show up. And so while we're seeing about a 20% increase this year in activism overall, it's not as much focused on M&A outcomes, it's focused on operational improvements, cost reductions, increased efficiency, capital allocation, and breakups, things where you don't have to have an external party involved. We expect in 2023 to see another bump up again in, in activism from this year, primarily because as valuations have decreased significantly in second, in, you know, through, through the year, there's many, many more uh, vulnerable companies. Now, for big A activism, ESG has always been a key wedge issue to support change, but it has almost always been primarily governance related. So think board tenure, leadership structure, compensation, structural defenses. Those factors were used by activists to try to establish that the board is entrenched and needs to be changed. They largely map also to what a lot of the stewardship uh, teams at a BlackRock or Vanguard care about and ISS and Class Lewis. And so were important, were, those factors were important to secure support from governance constituencies. How, however, over the past several years, we have started to see big A activists using social and environmental factors to supercharge their campaigns. So for instance, over the past five years, you've seen activist slates go from being very, you know, very non-diverse to increasingly diverse. You saw, say, in 2019, Elliott leverage carbon transition and, and climate in a lot of their power and utility campaigns. More recently, you've seen Starboard use uh, environmental concerns in their proxy fight at Huntsman. You've seen Elliott use worker safety at Suncor. Um, and, and so people are putting those factors into their proxy fights to try to establish problems with leadership and the board and board oversight. But most notably has been the advent of activist funds or strategies that focus on ESG factors that are financially material. So I'd say kind of one of the watershed moments was when Jana and Calisters ran a campaign at, uh, at, at Apple regarding child technology use. But it was really when Value Act formed um, the Spring Fund in 2018, you had Inclusive and a couple other funds that were focused on, we're gonna do activism, but we're gonna focus on ENS factors that, that relate to, uh, relate to our financial material as, as, as a core thesis. So you started to see that, and then it really hit an inflection point with uh, engine number one's campaign at Exxon in late 2020, uh, early 2021. That represented really the first big proxy fight that was fought on the basis of an ENS, uh, uh, an ENS uh, uh, factor, which was very focused on capital investment uh, and, and, and how Exxon was dealing with, uh, with, with climate transition. They had a relatively small stake, but they still won three seats. Again, I would say, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, that was very situation specific. 
So Exxon had been, you know, generally viewed by the investor community as not being fully responsive to large shareholders on environmentally focused uh, demands and shareholder proposals. And capital investment is so tied into performance. And at that time, it, you know, folks uh, in oil and gas industry that were more focused on uh, uh, on renewables were getting a premium. And so there was a, a, a financial linkage uh, to uh, to that campaign. So I'm not sure how much that is going to be played out. And I think you saw that in this year in 2022, you, most of the ESG focused campaigns mounted by big A activists have kind of fallen flat. So ICON mounted two very idiosyncratic uh, campaigns related to uh, animal rights at McDonald's and Kroger. Both did not garner much support. You're, I'll be very interested to see what Bluebell, which has a de minimis stake in, in, uh, in BlackRock, is now pushing for the removal of Larry Fink uh, based on, on, on their ESG policies. Again, we'll see whether that gets a lot of traction but doesn't seem to be uh, getting a lot of, uh, outside of the press. And then I would also say there's competing tensions now where – ESG is now being hit by the anti-woke movement. You know, oil and gas has outperformed um, at, uh, post the Ukraine invasion. And so there's a lot of other factors that are muddying it and changing, you know, uh, changing the dynamic versus where we were with en uh, at the time of engine number one. Now, the final point I'll leave off after this on the environment is on little a activism, we also saw a significant uptick in the number of proposals that on, on ENS factors uh, that, uh, that, that occurred in 2022. And that was related to uh, the SEC uh, guidance on, on uh, no action guidance. However, if you look at the level of success, so there's about 100% increase in proposals, but we saw significantly uh, less uh, uh, support by, uh, by shareholders for those proposals. And the big passives really led the charge. So if you look at social proposals, BlackRock and Vanguard basically have the level of their support on social proposals to 20% and 10% respectively. And they reduced their support um, materially for environmental proposals down to 20% and around 13%. Uh, percent. So again, you're seeing the, the sand shift a little there as well. So I'll, I'll pause there um, if, if we wanna discuss anything more on the environment. Yeah, thanks. Thanks Pete for the overview. Uh, definitely wanna come back to some of those themes. Uh, Eduardo, let's, let's turn to you. There's a lot happening at the SEC, a lot of chatter about impact, potential impact of universal proxy cards and uh, other proposed changes in voting procedures at institutional investors. Can you give us a sense of what's happening on that landscape and how it may impact ESG activism? Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll try to give you the, uh, the short version of the story since you know we could probably talk going for an hour on the subject. But you know, for better or worse, the universal proxy card is the uh, topic to jure this, this fall and just to you know, take a step back. The idea of the universal proxy card has been percolating up and down the SEC for, for several years, right? But it's only became um, reality last, I think it was last November, the rules went into effect with, with, with effectiveness as of September 1st of this year. Since I started practicing 23 plus years ago um, and forever, the rule had been that if there was a director contest, um, there would be uh, multiple proxy cards circulating, right? So the SEC rules were designed in such a way that um, except for short slates, which is a separate subject, right? An activist that was, that was going for control of the board would have to prepare its own proxy card that they would have to not only file with the SEC, but mail to shareholders. That was separate and apart from the proxy materials that the company would prepare and the proxy card that the company would, would, would distribute to the shareholders where only the company's nominees would be on the card. So effectively, again, you had one, two proxy cards out there, one by the company or from the company with the company's nominees and one by the dissident with the dissident's nominees. And strategy and practice around director contests had been designed for that scenario. Now universal proxy kicks in. And what that means is that both the company and the dissident have an obligation to include the other's nominees in their proxy card, right? So the prox if there is a director contest, the, the, the company's card would have two columns, one with the company's nominees, one with the dissident's nominees, and shareholders would get that same card and they can mix and match from both slates, right? So in the past, instead of having to choose which card to choose, 
which card to pick, which would have automatically excluded the nominees of the other side. Now directors can look at both slates in the same card and say, you know, I want three of the company's nominees and three of the dissidents nominees. And um, that is what Universal Proxy is about. There's been a couple of contests so far. We'll, we'll, we're all speculating what Universal Proxy is going to do. Um, so again, what I'm going to say next is speculation and maybe I'm right. Um, uh, maybe I'm wrong. If I'm wrong, I'm sure Mike will be kind enough to delete this website from 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 his from his posting. But uh, I think there's a general consensus on the on the subject. So w w three things, three points I would make. Um, first and foremost, the fact that uh, all directors are going to be in a single card means that unlike in the past where you would see hedge funds, uh, big A, you know, activists. Um, target specifically directors in a short slate situation. Um, so they would come out and say, you know, this is my, this are the the two the two three directors that I'm that me the dissident is sponsoring, and they would say, in addition, I'm supporting the following three directors, the three the following three incumbent directors, right? Um, and that would be what the distance card would say and the proximity chair would say. In other words, the, the activists would have the ability to cherry pick from amongst the directors, the incumbent directors, and decide who in the dissident's opinion were the weakest. And again, specifically target those and shareholders at large wouldn't have the ability. They would either go with the full company slate or the dissident slate as, as cherry picked by them. Now that the entire slate of incumbents is going to be up for election, if you will, right? Um, that means that there's going to be um, a need from the company, from the directors as a whole, to be very engaged, very proactive when facing a dissident, and frankly, even in non-contested situations, because each director needs to appreciate that even though they might not be specifically targeted by an activist. ISS or Glass Lewis in looking at the slate or, or any large shareholder can agree or disagree with the dissident as to who are the weak directors, the weak incumbent directors, right? So while in the past, again, the, the boards that the, the board members who were not specifically target could sort of sit back and you know, I'm sure they were rooting for their for their colleagues. The reality is that they they were pretty confident that that they would not, you know, they would stay in office. That's not true anymore. So again, I think there's going to be a, a push for each member of the board to be very, very proactive uh, every every year. So I think that's consequence number one. Um, consequence number two, um, I believe, is that there's going to be an increase, um, maybe not immediate, but over time, we're going to see an increase in the sort of the, the hedge fund, the big A activists, um, especially the smaller players or new members of the community. Um, ultimately, I don't think that for, you know, big, reputable sort of uh, large funds, like, you know, whether it's Elliot or, or you know, Starboard, um, those guys, I don't think really care much about universal proxy because they will, regardless of whether or not there's universal proxy, they are going to engage in campaigns. They're going to print their own materials. They would do multiple mailings. So I think for them, it's, you know, I frankly, I don't know, you know, I, it's it's going to be questionable whether or not they like universal proxy, but I think there's going to be new entrants in the field, smaller funds um, that have a benefit, or will see a benefit with, with universal proxy from a cost perspective, as well as I think from a leverage perspective, we, we could, we can speculate that with universal proxy is going to be Universal Proxy is going to make it easier to for an activist to push a board and management team to settle for one or two directors. I think Universal Proxy, again, is going to make it easier for the smaller funds or any fund to go and say, you know, I want one or two, knowing that, you know, they probably will get the benefit of the doubt when shareholders, um, you know, have to pick up uh, the board uh, in, in the context itself. So I think that's number two. And number three, uh, which to me is the most interesting one. I think um, I've seen some commentary recently, but I think for many months people lost track of this, which is that the little A activists, 
right? This is the uh, single agenda ESG focus fund, or not fund, but entity person um, that in the past would have chosen to do a, a non-binding proposal under 1488, right? Because it was the only, the cheapest way, maybe the only way that this organization could make their way into a proxy statement. Those people, I believe, are, are likely over time to move from 14 AA proposals to director proposals um, because it's a much more, again, the costs are gonna be similar. I don't think that many of them are gonna take this tact, uh, take the tactic or embrace the tactic because they actually want to win a director election. I think winning an election will require you know, significant funds and multiple mailings and, and, and lobbying of shareholders. I think many of these groups are gonna do it just because being on the company's proxy card with an actual nominee is a great platform from a PR perspective for them. And you can imagine, for example, a, a you know or organized labor or some environmental group goes out, gets to, you know, famous people to run as as directors for pick your for favorite Fortune 500. And just doing that, again, I think it's going to give this group some leverage to extract something out of management, even though they might not ultimately be um, in a position, they might know that they would not be in a position to win, but just, again, the leverage that you get from a PR perspective um, might be sufficient for many of these people to actually, um, you know, launch proxy or director contests. And I think that's going to be, you know, maybe the um, the one that we won't see right away next year. Um, but I expect that over time, that's something that we will start seeing um, during annual meetings. So um, that's what I would like to say. That's what I have on, on Universal Proxy. Um, the other initiative that probably folks have heard about is the whole 13D, 13G proposal changes to, among other things, reduce the window of nominee, uh, the window that, that hedge funds and activists and others have to file a 13D from 10 days down to five days, which is sort of long overdue. And there are changes to the definition of, of, of what counts as a group for SEC purposes that I think is going to have impact an impact for um, campaigns in the future. But we, you know, we're still waiting for the SEC to come back um, with what the definitive rules they're going to propose. So we'll see where that heads into uh, in, the, in the coming months. Great. Thanks, Eduardo. Yeah, yeah. No, that's very helpful. Shut up. I'll come back, uh, yeah. come back a little bit, I think. Uh, so we've got an uncertain landscape. We've got new SEC rules that nobody knows what's going to happen. That, that's got to be very comforting for boards and advisors. So Tara, this is where you come in. Uh, give us yeah. a sense of if you're a corporate board member, you're in a member of management advising the board, where should they start? Where should they make sure management is focused to kind of address this new landscape coming in uh, to this year? Yeah, thank, thanks, Mike. Uh, and, and Pete and Eduardo um, laid the framework and the context so well. Um, as, as we all can see, this, this, um, the volatility and kind of chaos in the market um, writ large that's been really kind of our life, our lives over the past several years in particular, it's really continuing. And so that means that boards and management and, and interacting and briefing their boards need to be even more um, focused, intentional in terms of how they're keeping their boards informed on these developments. And in particular, what do they mean for that company in that market with that geographic footprint? Um, I think that, that uh, there's the evolving risk landscape it, it, it's, it continues to evolve with such rapidity and the nuances that are involved that really make the fiduciary obligations of the board that more uh, that much more acute and, and the risk profile that much more, <clears throat> excuse me, um, that much more uh, necessary to understand and define how ESG and human rights presents in that company, in that industry, with that footprint. What we've seen, in, and when Pete was talking about engine number one and Exxon uh, a year, about a year or so ago, uh, I think in August of 2021, that really was, I think, a wake up moment for a lot of boards who thought that is significant. You know, very small, kind of single issue activist investor, which 
you know, was successful in pulling along the large institutional investors, the Black Rocks and others to then replace three of the board seats, that, that was really notable. And I, I saw a real uptick in terms of board outreach and, you know, CEO, general counsel outreach saying, okay, we really need to understand this. Um, and then, and we can talk about it uh, uh, as part of our discussion, the fact that we have this continuing pressure coming from a lot of different constituencies and stakeholders, particularly on climate, but also on diversity, equity, inclusion, uh, social, the S part of it, and, and threaded throughout all of it, the governance piece of it, and how what does that mean for boards and board oversight, as well as management, um, that, that this, this sort of, of growing uh, tension on that side in the United States more recently has been, have, we've also seen the rise of the anti-ESG movement, right? And, and that's been building for the last year or so, but it's really gained some momentum and legs. Having said that, I, I agree with Pete I, I, um, in that really the climate and the, the ESG kind of proponents still are, are in my view, uh, gaining and continuing to gain the currency and the intention of boards and companies. But you have to be, particularly depending upon where your facilities and where you're located, you have to be really watching this anti-ESG movement and the states that are really starting, in the US Congress, as we were talking about a few minutes ago, before we started, especially the House, what you're gonna see the activity at the House level, really following up with um, Chair Gensler, the SEC, and others in terms of the uh, executive branch agencies that are pushing what um, the anti-ESG movement views as this extreme agenda. Um, I would say that as a board, then what you really want to make sure you're doing is staying abreast of how these developments are affecting your industry, your business, and what is the what are the mechanisms, the governance mechanisms, not only at the board, but in management to make sure that you're getting the type of reporting up that is incisive and focused and you can really make informed judgments. I think that the anti-ESG movement really, uh, those uh, the ones that really I think are more credible, just my personal opinion, are the ones where they're saying we need to understand how this com this um, commitment or or uh, statement with regard to climate in your business how does it redound to the benefit of your financial performance of your long term value of your risk and that's where I think boards and management need to be focused when they do a materiality assessment for ESG and human rights in their business it's got to be focused on and this is what boards are concerned about and have been concerned about given the breadth of risk areas that are subsumed within ESG and human rights, which are the ones that are real for your business, given your industry, given your supply chain, given your global footprint, your customer base, your employee base, as there still is a focus on talent, right? War for talent. And then what are you doing to really address those in terms of your enterprise risk management, your governance, your oversight, and then how are you, when you set a goal or a target or a priority, how are you measuring your progress against that? First of all, how did you set it? And how are you measuring your progress against that? Um, so that is where I think also from a defensive posture, candidly, with the anti-ESG movement, that's what you need to be able to establish. You need to be able to establish that the reason why you have these climate commitments, these DEI commitments and the like is because of the correlation of those to your long-term value and your financial performance as a company. And that I think you're going to see more of, I, I'm interested in what Pete and, and Eduardo have to say, but I think you're going to see more of that. Um, just picking up on something that Eduardo was focused on with the universal proxy card is the individual, each individual board member. So I think there's going to be a continued focus, which there has been, but a growing and continued focus on board competencies, board composition, and, that, and board refreshment to make sure that your board is really uh, has the skill set uh, experience to really bring to bear, given your current ESG uh, risk posture and 
today and kind of going forward in, in the near midterm uh, for your company. And so that universal proxy card development now means, as Eduardo said, it's not just the shareholder nominees from the activist investors, it's every single incumbent director. You're going to need to make sure that your directors, that there is a real communication of their competencies, their ex expertise, their, their need and, and contribution to the board, the rationale for why they're there, because there's going to be this, this acute focus on it given the universal proxy card. So I think you're gonna see even more focus on um, from a board standpoint, and this we do a lot of is board evaluations. You know, how are they, when was the last time you did one? How are those, all of those directors stacked up based on as, a, as a compared to your risk profile, right? And so how are you gonna make sure that as you're engaging with your key shareholders and key stakeholders, that they're, you're building this trust and awareness of how this company and the board is positioned to really support the company in understanding and navigating these continuously um, and continuing evolving risk landscape. And so, so I think you, we're seeing already, and we have for a while, um, this focus on boards really doing that self-evaluation. And I think you're now with the universal proxy card, even more so to make sure that they're really positioned um, to do that. The other um, key takeaway I would say is boards have been doing uh, you know, tabletop exercises for like cyber risks, right? If there's a, been a, you know, a simulation of a cyber, I think boards are going to do more and should be doing more of that, not just with cyber, but what happens if you get an activist investor? What happens if you get a climate activist coming at you saying one of your facilities, right, is is polluting or is or you're not meeting your your targets or what you've said. Um, so I think there's going to be a lot more of that to really make sure that there's that awareness at the board level in all of these uh, areas that can create risk to the business. And then finally, again, with reporting and disclosure, I think boards and we've spent a lot of time with boards who really want to make sure that the company's reporting and reports that touch upon, which can come in many different forms, right? Touch upon ESG, um, that they are, how are they aligned with the disclosures that they're making, um, especially with the SEC, with the climate uh, disclosure rulemaking, cybersecurity disclosure rulemaking, that the SEC is really um, creating even more uh, emphasis on, and, and not just the SEC, by the way, um, globally, an emphasis on the disclosure and the specificity uh, in those disclosures and how you can best uh, back them up with data. Um, and I think that's gonna be another area of focus for boards uh, and their management. So just I'll pause there. There's, I know there's a lot in that, but um, there's a lot out there for these boards. Yeah, no, that's super helpful. Thanks, Tara. And one follow-up uh, on, on sort of next steps for boards, I've seen some, stuff out there about should companies be doing something different on the bylaw front as a result of universal proxy and activism pressure? Is there, is there any advice you, you or Eduardo have on that front? I mean, I'll jump in. I, you know, the answer is yes. There, there's there been um, several companies starting in um, mid or early August of this year that have um, amended their, their their bylaws. I think that's uh, that's the right and proper step. I think the way they've done it is still, um, you know, there are various approaches that have been taken. And I would think there are generally three, three categories of, of amendments. One is uh, certain amendments to just make sure that um, the advance notice procedures are reflective of the new SEC rules. Specifically, there are certain guard, guardrails that the SEC included in in the rules, such as a such as the fact that a dissident has to, in order to use universal proxy, they must solicit at least two thirds of the outstanding shares. So, um, items like those have been incorporated into bylaws to enable the company to have a private right of action if if the activist violates those rules. Otherwise, we'll have to all be relying on, on the SEC to be catching those. Um, second thing is there are some tight. I mean, some some companies have uh, also, I think, rightfully so, updated their bylaws to. Um, 
you know, just take into account the various ways that traditional hedge fund activists uh, accumulate stock, potential try to catch conflicts of interest and the like. Um, and the third area is one where, you know, companies understand that there is this potential for the little a activists to start submitting nominees. And if you look at traditional bylaw, uh, advanced notice bylaws, uh, the disclosure obligations were typically tailored to um, a traditional hedge fund, right? So there was required disclosure around economic interest in the company, um, whether there were, you know, whether the, the dissident had um, derivatives, was shorting the stock, that type of things that were more proper for an economic actor. Um, things like uh, that would be relevant for shareholders to appreciate the scope and intent and issues around uh, a, a little a activist or a, a ESG activist were not really picked up by bylaws. So you're seeing in various ways bylaws um, picking up a broader construct that would go beyond, um, you know, economic interests or disclosure goes beyond the traditional uh, things that the bylaws would be calling for. So again, I think that's something that certainly most, if not all public companies should be revisiting with their advisors and thinking through, you know, what, if anything, they need to do to their existing bylaws. All right, thank you. Uh, I want to hit, uh, Peter, come back to a topic with you. And then uh, for the audience, some folks have started to put questions in the Q&A. Please do that in the Q&A tab, and we'll get to those in, in just a minute. Pete, on the, on the topic of uh, how board should react, how seriously should a board take an ESG activism focus campaign? I mean, uh, we heard about Exxon, you know, McDon you mentioned a few, and then Tara referred to how boards can think about it. Um, but what's what's the right way? Like how how concerned should they be, or this is just another flavor of traditional kind of activism and just you know the cause of the day? Yeah, and, and so I'll be I'll be pretty quick here because I think Tara hit a lot of the the really important points here, which which is what matters is the core thesis and whether it is persuasive to the rest of the shareholders, which means financial materiality. That's the that's the north star. You can't talk about gestational cages for pigs to get a seat. And as, as, as Tara said, it's not checkbox. You know, it's not what MSCI is doing. It is situation specific analysis about your business, geography, supply chain, people. What actually are the levers of value? Is there an e ENS factor associated with them? And if yes, then then yeah, that's going to be uh, uh, you know a risk. But but that's a very very small portion of the uh, uh, of of kind of this ESG you know focused activism uh, that that we're likely to see. So I, I, going back to what Eduardo says, I you know I think you're going to see a lot more of these because of universal proxy, a lot of single note campaigns that are just gadfly, a you know, different version of the gadfly shareholder proposals. So the board should be attuned to that, but they should really focus less on all that noise and more on the substance and the financial materiality of those ESG factors that could provide the real hooks for an activist to get board representation or affect significant change. That's helpful. Tara, let me, let me come back to you with a, with a follow-up on this anti-woke kind of anti-ESG activism. And you mentioned the, the utility of tabletops for boards. Do you think it's worth companies doing an assessment if they have operations in certain states or they know they have pension fund investments from states that have been public about how they're feeling about this area to start to work on that now? Or is the likelihood, I mean, you, what do you, and in particular, I mean, you mentioned the house, like there's a lot of chatter, but how much, you know, given all the things boards have to focus on coming into the season, how much do you think they should look at this issue? Well, so again, and to echo Pete a bit, right, is, is again, it's where your risk sits. So if you have major operations in a state that has anti-ESG, Texas, Florida, right? I mean, if you do, you need to understand that. I mean, you, your job as a director is to make sure that you understand the mission critical risk facing that business, and that there are the right controls, oversight, management at the management level and reporting up to the board. I would posit that that means if you have significant investment from a state pension fund from Texas or one of the states that really has made this a priority, and everybody tends to focus on Texas and Florida, but there are about 11 states that are really kind of in that sphere, right? Um, at least facially. Uh, but 
then you need to understand that you should prepare for it. Uh, you know, in terms of, you know, the House of Representatives here, um, not to sound like a cynical Washingtonian, but, but you know, I, 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 yeah, watch it. Definitely, you should be briefed as to what's going on, but that's a very slow uh, moving train, right? It's more in your business. If you have facilities, operations, or you have significant investment from a state, in a state or from a state that has this concern and they've articulated and they're pulling their money out of BlackRock and they're looking at whether or not um, you have, if you're a major company, you have an agenda, they're going, you know, the Strive Management, right, Strive Asset Management, going after the companies that have uh, a commitment for climate when they think it's too much, they need to be more invested in fossil fuels. And you you need to understand that that, that sits, I would think, as a general proposition and bucket of mission critical risk for your business. So that's, what, and I absolutely agree with Pete's comment that, that, and this has been the case, it's just even more so as this uh, continually chaotic uh, risk environment is, as a board, you need to be focused, and as management, you need to be focused on the ESG areas that are real and material for your business. And that is a really simple statement and challenging to do because that risk landscaping is, is, escape, landscape is evolving so rapidly. And that's part of the challenge of management to make sure that the board is keeping abreast of those developments in an efficient and effective way. That's why I said about reporting, make sure those reports that you're getting and the line of communication for management to your board um, is really helpful and focused as to your company for uh, ESG activists, like which, which activists are, are, are really active in your industry for your peer companies. That's where I'd be really focusing my attention. Uh, maybe if I can jump in, I, uh, w w one comment, it's it's quite unfortunate that, you know, politics, which, you know, has permeated so many aspects of, of society, right, we were fighting about wearing masks, right, a couple of years ago, uh, politics has now penetrated the boardroom, right, this are, so this idea of ESG and, you know, anti-ESG or anti-woke, it seems to me so, um, so insane to have to be discussing that topic uh, when we talk about corporate governance, right? I mean, we're we're talking there basically two ideas that have been embraced by you know different political factions. Now it's turning into a you know red state blue state situation, which again I, I think is is an unfortunate um, outcome of all this. Um, there are two pieces, uh, so going back to what Taryn and, and Pete said, that, to me, there are two pieces for boards to appreciate here. One is uh, the question of their fiduciary duties as directors, right? And what all this means for you know, insurance, all those good things. Um, the law has not changed, at least in Delaware, right? I mean, directors um, have a broad latitude to decide what's you know what's right for the company and stockholders. Um, ESG is just a component of that, um, but in sort of deciding what they need to do, again, there is their 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 decisions, their reasonable business decisions should be respected by the court. They do need to make sure, though, that whether it's implemented a, implementing an environmental policy or you know, new governance changes, they, they need to make sure that, you know, as a board, they create a proper record so that a court is not uh, second guessing later on what they did because of a lack of, you know, cont of a con contemporary record. Um, having said that, it's also true that if you look at some decisions um, coming out of Delaware in the last few years, there's, um, when talking about care mark, care mark duties, that I, the duty of oversight, um, there's been this, uh, in my view, this undercurrent of ESG concerns, right? We saw it in in the case where you know an ice cream uh, company, you know, was uh, let uh, listeria outbreak contaminate products, and the court was pretty tough with them. And 
So I, I think there's, again, this ESG idea that, that we need to be mindful of or courts need to be mindful of um, where, you know, courts are made of judges who are humans and humans live in, you know, reality and, and in an environment where ESG is becoming um, so important across the spectrum of, of you know, every of society as, at large. I, I think people, boards need to understand that um, when implementing a uh, policy, you know, ESG is going to, you know, people are going to pay attention. Judges are going to pay more attention than they might have, you know, 15, 20 years ago. Mike, can I just jump in for one quick second? I just yeah. want to also mention that in terms of the anti-ESG movement, that's really unique to the U.S. If you're a global company, the EU doesn't have an anti-ESG movement. Mm -hmm. Now, one would say they're also moderating a little bit, like on their value chain, mandatory environmental human rights due diligence. They're just the last week or so where the EU courts have said, wait a minute, you know, we have to have some reasonable boundaries. So, so there is that, but there's no anti-ESG movement in Europe. That's a very unique uh, construct or reality here here in the U.S. And I also don't want to overblow it because I do think that it, it's real. And if you have presence in states or you take money or you have investment from state pension funds in those states that are very inclined that way, you need to, as Eduardo said, we're talking about mission critical risks as a board. That's what you need to know about. But I just want to just to remind folks that that's as to the U.S. Outside the U.S. doesn't really have that kind of uh, of dynamic. Um, and so you just have to look at that uh, as well. Keeping it in perspective. Yeah, great advice. So let's go to audience questions. We got a bunch here. Uh, and yeah, you all don't need to comment on all of them, but maybe if, for the panelists, if something grabs you, and if you have additional comment, jump in. Uh, but no need to uh, everybody to agree if you do agree. So here's the first. Does the panel support the recommendation for board members to request that management or investor relations perform investor profiles for companies on a regular basis so as to assist in tracking both what your uh, investors are up to in terms of their actions and risk priorities by investor and mitigations. Yeah. Pete's nodding, so jump right in there, Pete. Yeah, and, and so I, I think, you know, the interesting thing is investor, the investor relations function within a company really has kind of elevated to a, um, to, to almost a board level. Um, and so I think that <clears throat> there should be room for IR and for usually the corporate secretary function or the general counsel function that is doing ESG related outreach to stewardship communities, uh, uh, constituencies. So some that, that's, that, that tends to be more integrated. There really should be time, you know, whether it's on a semi-annual or quarterly basis uh, for folks to come in and talk about, you know, who your investors are whether there are any risks associated with them, prior histories of activism, prior teaming up with other activists, um, talking about what their feedback has been, uh, and, and, and just getting a, a general temperature check. Um, and again, that can't just be your active holders. That also has to be the passives. You have to have a plan for engaging with BlackRock and Vanguard and, 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 and folks like that and, and in Europe you know, Norges and, and other folks, so that you have a holistic view of your shareholder base and where their priorities are on financial as well as ESG uh, factors. Others, different point of view on that? No, no, just I was going to, yeah, endorse what Pete said. Absolutely. I mean, I think the active and the passives and really, because that then it, it enriches the understanding of the board and making judgments um, and governance uh, related issues for, you know, on their behalf. So I, I agree with Pete. So let's, let's take a second question. Uh, any thoughts from the panel on the tactic being used by individual investor of Tesla who's suing uh, the board based on Musk's compensation package? Uh, speculation here is it seems like the same topic could work for individuals and organizations who see companies missing important areas related to ESG, human rights, climate change, et cetera. Is there a litigation risk uh, that the panel sees here? I mean, I, I guess I don't see a new risk there. The issue of compensation has been, you know, used before uh, in litigation. So I think that's one area that companies all, always have to be worried about uh, or mindful in the record they create, make sure that, you know, there's no um, second guessing later by a court. The, 
I guess with the second half of, of the question, I, I go back to ESG is just going to be such a, a, a topic that is getting so much attention that um, you can see, and we, we're already seeing cases being brought by the plaintiff's bar uh, ceasing on a ESG subject, right? Whether it's safety uh, or labor or other matters that um, just because there's so much emphasis on ESG, I think it's almost natural that it will become a subject of, of litigation in Delaware and elsewhere. Yeah, I agree that we talk a lot with boards about litigation risk, right? ESG related litigation risk. And where is it likely to come from for that company, uh, mm -hmm. given uh, their risk profile and the statements, the, their positioning and what they've been doing in a given area? I do think we're going to see an increase in ESG related litigation. Um, we've seen it coming out actually also in, in uh, the EU human rights tends to be labor uh, related by human rights uh, related litigation as well. Um, so I think we, we are not going to see, I don't think in the U.S. we're going to see that kind of uh, human rights related litigation um, that we've seen some of those cases in the EU, but we do see uh, a potential risk for increased ESG related litigation having to do with things like um, DEI, certainly human capital management is an area of focus, um, both at the SEC and for institutional investors, um, and pay equity and CEO compensation. And by the way, also tying compensation to ESG uh, uh, is very much a uh, priority for a lot of the larger uh, shareholders and institutional investors. So that's a good point. So with the increased Litigation risk, you both mentioned plaintiffs are already starting to look at this area. Boards are accustomed to, you know, when they go through compensation decisions, the record is very well done, right? Because as Eduardo mentioned, that's been a hot topic of attacks on boards. Are you, do you think boards got to start following the same robust procedure around how they disclose and what they talk about related to some of these hot litigation topics in ESG? Like start creating, whether it's NOMGov or your risk committee, like the same kind of documentation and review to defend the board later? I think that should be done with respect to any board decision or action, right? I mean, the record has to be created. Uh, you have to assume anything the board do or doesn't do, right? It's gonna be, could be one day the subject of litigation. So I, I, yeah, the answer is yes, they have to do it. And they have to be mindful of the increased risk in this area. So everything you were doing before around comp and other topics, make sure you're doing as well. Um, and on ESG topics. The one thing I would add to that um, is part of the challenge for a lot of the, for instance, just look in the SEC climate disclosure rulemaking, uh, which is a behemoth, right? But, but putting that aside, the demands um, and expectations on companies with regard to their ESG, particularly climate um, commitments is data. And, and it's how, it's what standard they're going to go go uh, follow, right? Um, TCFD, what you know, it tends to be the one. It's the one the SEC on climate has followed. Um, how have you set those targets, right? The basis for that, and then how are you backing up your statements about what you have achieved? And, and so a lot, and a lot of the pushback just on the supply chain and the scope one, two, three, the three, right? The scope three mm -hmm. is the ability to really be able to back up commitments and, and statements in terms of what you have done as a company. So there's a lot of focus on the quality of the data and the information that companies have, the systems that they've already got in place, how do they curate the data that they need to back up certain decisions um, and uh, disclosures with regard to ESG. Great, thanks. Uh, this next one, I'll amend the question a little bit, but it's it's one that comes up off and on, which is, should boards be looking for specific ESG expertise in their new directors that they're looking for? Like, is that, or is it a, is it a factor where the board in general, Tara, to kind of go back to your original discussion, needs to be informed of all the risks, or do you are we moving to a place where like being able to identify but in terms of the effects of what universal proxy might have, that certain directors have certain kinds of ESG expertise relevant to that business. What do you think? You know, I think, <clears throat> I hate to sound like a lawyer, it depends, but um, I think that as a general matter, 
I, you can't just have one director who's your ESG person, right? Expert. The whole board needs to really be educated on what ESG related risk areas are for that company and that industry and what they're, why the decisions the company has made uh, make sense and, and they support. Um, I think if you are a company in an industry or in a sector that requires or would benefit from a, a deep particular expertise, having that on the board makes sense. But it's a, to me, it's a, an individual assessment as to that company, that industry, and what are the skill sets that are needed uh, at the board in order for that board to operate and govern effectively. Um, the other question we get a lot, <clears throat> Mike, I don't know if you've gotten it, is should there be an ESG committee on the board, right? right. Like what is the structure that we should, and we work a lot with companies, what makes sense for them because it, it is impacted by their, their footprint. How big are they? What lines of business do they have? Where do they sit? What board committees do they currently have? If you're a small mid-sized company Layering another committee on the board may not make sense. If you're really early in your ESG journey as a company, you, you probably don't want to have just an ESG committee. You want the full board engaged on that. So mm -hmm. how you set up the governing structures is also bespoke for that company because it's got to be informed by the risk profile, the the position the company is, the status the company is in today, the board governance structures and committees now, because it could be that that board um, evaluation that you do, inc including the committees of the board, you would say, well, we're not going to set up a new ESG committee, but we think we should realign the committees that the board has to make sure that they're really focused on the risks and the challenges the company is facing and expected to, to continue continue to face over the coming years. That's great, thank you. We got two more uh, questions here in three minutes. So we'll, let's try to do our answers, uh, focused answers here. So these are great questions and thanks for the audience. Uh, the first one is, do the panelists think ESG, ESG trends and activism in this area pose a new risk for individual directors and subsequently, should they be looking more closely at their DNO insurance? Again, I, I think it's just the, the, the board, the, the, the law has not changed in Delaware, right? It's in order for this to become a, an actual you know, liability for directors, it has to be that this monetary liability would have to rise to the level of a duty of loyalty, which means that you know, something really wrong has happened. Um, so as long as you focus on you know, enterprise level risks uh, and each company should know which those are, I think that there, there should not be any further exposure for board members. Very good. Okay, thank you. And then the last question uh, we'll go to, do you think that we will see more shareholder proposals seeking shareholder approval of changes to advance notice bylaw provisions in response to the bylaw changes that are being implemented with the universal proxy rule? I mean, it, it really depends. Well, I was, I was going to say, it really depends. I, I, I think that to the extent that folks feel like they are getting out of, bound, you know, out of bounds, um, you may start seeing uh, uh, similar proposals, similar to what we've seen with other structural defenses. But again, I think it's going to depend on, you know, the company and, and you know, the general trend in terms of how those are structured. But Eduardo, you, you, you probably have some other views. No, no, I, I, I think it's, it's, we'll, we'll see. I mean, I heard about some commentary around, uh, you know, the possibility of those proposals, but, you know, it's something we'll have to wait for one or two uh, annual cycles to figure out what, what folks are doing. Is there anything else on that? No, no, I, I think uh, Pete and Eduardo hit it. Great. Uh, last question, and this is this is a good one. Given uh, well, at least where Stanford's located, the rest we're all over the country for the panel. Uh, do the panelists feel that this trend for public companies in terms of ESG pressure will start to impact how private companies look at doing business? Obviously, shareholder activism is different, but do you see expectations changing on the private company front uh, as well? Well, as a general matter, I, the answer for me is. Yes, not to the same level, obviously, as a, as a public company, depending upon who your investors are, right? Then, 
and, and also candidly, what we're talking about in the three of us here today really is risk and it's how well your company and the board understand risks facing that company. Do they understand them? How are they positioned to address them? Um, and, and so, yes, I think particularly large private companies are, are, are watching this space. And I think if, we, if it is understood as I believe it should be in terms of understanding the risks facing that, those companies, then the board and the company should understand that and have the right controls in place to address them. Great, thank you. So we are at 1030. I wanna respect everybody's calendar. Uh, first, I'd like to thank our panelists, Eduardo, Tara, Pete, thanks for taking the time to join us and sharing your expertise. I wanna thank Maria and the Stanford Law School programs team for all their help and also our audience. Thank you for joining. Thank you for the engagement. I wish you all a happy holidays and a happy proxy season. And we hope to see you at the Rock Center soon. Thanks all. Have a great day. Bye-bye.